Thanks for checking out another cast from TealTownUSA.com. In this episode, we speak with the TV voice of the San Jose Sharks, Randy Hahn, who discusses what he's seen in the preseason so far, his thoughts on Suomela and Chartier, and the return of Joe Thornton. And Randy also talks about working with Jamie Baker and Brett Hedekin, the three-man broadcast plans for this season, Devin Setaguchi joining the radio broadcast, the benefits of new LED lighting, his favorite calls, and Randy answers the question, is this the best San Jose Sharks team he's ever seen? Hi, everyone. Welcome to another interview conversation here on TealTownUSA.com. I am Eric Kura. You can always follow me on Twitter at PuckGuy14. With me today, it is our honor to have Randy Hahn, play-by-play voice of your San Jose Sharks. Randy, good morning. How was your summer? The summer was great, Eric. It was obviously a little longer than all of us would prefer, but uh, it was uh, good to get some rest and get recharged for the season and looking forward to it starting on Wednesday. Can't wait. Was at the game last night against Calgary. You saw pretty much the starting lineup against Calgary at home. What did you like and what needs to be kind of tweaked a little bit? Well, I think the thing that stuck out to me more than anything was the Sharks were playing a team that obviously didn't make the playoffs last year. They have a new coach. They have some new players. And they looked to be in more of a regular season mode, the Calgary Flames did, certainly at the start of the game, than the Sharks did. Um, they were outplaying the Sharks. The shots showed it. The scoreboard showed it. And then I thought probably after the first intermission, there may have been you know a little bit of a discussion in the dressing room like, hey, we, we've got to kick it up here a little bit. And uh, while the Sharks have a veteran team and everybody knows that these games don't matter they don't count toward the standings and in three weeks from now we'll forget everything that happened in that game (laughs) i think they started to um, step on the gas a little bit more they started to uh, push a little harder and then came to within a goal and almost got it tied up so um, you know not a great start but again you know don't look too much into these exhibition games uh, you can go 7-0 and in the preseason, and that guarantees you absolutely nothing once the, the puck drops to start a season. So I think it's still a process where uh, the new guys are getting used to one another. Um, there's new players at the forward position. There's two players who've never played in an NHL game before. And then you've got Eric Carlson fitting himself in, and then you've got a guy like Joe Thornton trying to get himself back to Uh, speed so a lot of different elements going into what the Sharks are preparing for right now versus what Calgary was Uh, and I would expect we'll see a better overall 60 minute performance on Sunday against Vegas in that last tune-up but it still won't be like opening night right and you don't want them to get too uh, crazy with uh, throwing out hits and such but do you, do you take from preseason games? I guess you kind of have to grade it on a curve a little bit and not expect too much. Well, I think what you're looking for more in the preseason, at least what I'm looking for from the Sharks team, I'm looking more at individuals than I'm looking at team play per se. Maybe when the power plays on the ice, you're looking more at team play right now because that's been identified as an area the Sharks really want to improve upon, and they ought to now with Carlson on the power play. Uh, so I'm looking more at... How is Antti Suomela fitting in? Is he going to be um, solid enough to be an NHL third-line center? Who's going to win that fourth-line battle? And it looks right now like Chartier is ahead of Gambrell for the spot. We'll wait and see how that shakes out. Uh, Are are our guys going to continue their upward trajectory like Timo Meyer? And, boy, it sure looks like he is. Mm -hmm. Is Kevin LeBanc going to take it to another level this year and improve on what was a, a better season last year and uh, that still remains to be seen it hasn't quite shown itself maybe as much as it has in a Timo Meyer and so on how's Braun going to adjust playing with Dylan so those are more the things that I've been looking for in the preseason rather than team play and and you know do the Sharks win the game or lose the game I think the process right now is more important than the result Uh, of course all of that changes once the season starts. Right. What have you liked from guys like uh, Zumel and Chartier? Because they seem that they have been pretty smooth going in these preseason games. And I, and I like the combination with Zumel with Jonas Donskoy. Uh, I think the, the combination of those two have been really dynamite so far. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you kind of naturally want to gravitate to 
feeling like they have chemistry because they're both from Finland. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. That doesn't necessarily guarantee they can play together, but they seem to be able to play well together. Uh, Suomela appears to be able to keep up and play a, a two-way game, which he'll have to as a, as a third-line center. And he's also got a lot of hockey sense in the way he plays, and we know Donskoy does. So that, that bodes well for those two uh, staying on that third line. But you just don't know once the season starts and situations change game to game and matchups. I mean, even within the game uh, last night against Calgary, Pete DeBoer, after a while, didn't like the way the top line looked, and he took Kane off the left wing and put Timo Meyer there. So, yeah, and that's in a preseason game. So, you know, nothing's married, but I, I've liked Suomela. He, he looks like the real deal, and Chartier has, has battled. He's been... Uh, to me, the more experienced-looking player, he's just had such a tr- tremendously tough time with injuries so far in his pro career. But I think it shows played hockey in the American Hockey League uh, at a level that, that maybe Gambrell certainly hasn't had the opportunity to yet. Uh, whether that means Gambrell ends up going to the Barracuda, I don't know. I don't know what Doug Wilson is going to do as far as the roster. Is he going to keep... Um, two extra forwards and a D. Is he going to cape two extra D and a forward? And right now it looks more like two D with probably Heat and Simek um, making the team and Gambrell being that extra forward in the press box. But we just don't know until Doug Wilson submits his, uh, his final uh, roster before Wednesday. Yeah, you have a lot of guys that are locked up, but you also have a great competition on the bottom six, which I love. Uh, the second six. The second six. I'm sorry. I should apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Brett Hedekin's thing, and I and I, I agree because uh, calling teammates bottom pair or bottom six it demeans them. I think, and Hedekin, gotcha. he's that's his pet peeve. So uh, I'm I'm all in with Hedy. So we go second six, not bottom six. I I I agree with that. That makes it makes a lot more sense. It's been you know we talk about the the uh, first six trying to get the lingo right now <laughs> uh, you can still call them top six okay. you can't call the other guys the this, bottom six good to know <laughs> <laughs> all right um you can call them whatever you want actually. <laughs> right so with thornton you know we, we this is his second game he, he played i think he's looked pretty good i think it's still working out the kinks from recovering from everything and then I wonder about Pavelski. You know, he he had some issues early on, but he seemed to come on strong late late in the season last year. And for that concern, you know, there's still that lingering thing going on with Pavelski, not on uh, on an extension just yet. Do you think something's going on with Wilson, or or does he have to eventually figure out cap room that includes potentially Eric Carlson at this point? I I don't really know about contracts for our captain and things like that that i'm sure that it's all going to work out with joe pavelski and i'm not worried about joe pavelski at all um, as far as his abilities Um, obviously his stats the last few years have been in a little bit of a downward trajectory from you know his best season three four years ago but he's still you know he's the leader of the team he's the heartbeat of the of the dressing room and uh you know, I, I don't worry about him at all. As far as Joe Thornton goes, Joe's knocking the rust off. I mean, when you when you think about it, last year, coming off the first knee surgery after um, the injury the prior year, he didn't really hit stride till about December. It was it, it seemed like December was when Joe Thornton looked like Joe Thornton. So it took him all of October and all of November to knock the rust off. Well, then he has another surgery in January. Now he's had a longer rehab, but there's still rust. He hasn't played that much NHL hockey because of the injury in the last two seasons. So, uh, And he's 39. So I think uh, Jumbo is still knocking the rust off, and he doesn't look himself yet to me. He certainly doesn't. And I think he would probably be honest with you to feel like he, to, if he were to say uh, he wasn't, 100% playing at the top of his game. 
Uh, but I expect that knocking the rust off process to be shorter than it was before. So, you know, maybe it takes October for Jumbo to get himself right. And in November, we start seeing him as the Joe Thornton that we're, we're much more used to. But I, I think that's going to happen. I think what you're seeing right now is a guy who just hasn't played a lot of hockey. And he's coming off back-to-back knee surgeries. And it's going to take a little bit more time for him to be at the top of his game. Yeah, I think Jebo's going to be, like you said, the rest will come off pretty quick. And I thought his game when he did get going last season was pretty impressive, uh, considering he had gone through the the knee issue beforehand. So as we approach opening night, you're going to have not one, but two color analysts that you'll be working with this season, and Jamie Baker and Brett Hedekin. You had worked with both of them last season, so I got to ask, what's it like having two analysts with you, and does it kind of alter things when you go back from different partners? Well, I think initially it did. You know, what we do requires reps. You have to do reps together to get chemistry, to be comfortable working on the air with one another, especially, and this is what was so tough for Brad Hedekin, and I'm not making excuses for him because he did a tremendous job, but not only did he have to unexpectedly step in when Jamie took a leave of absence, but we were, for the most part, separated by him being inside the glass and me being up in the booth. And that's an even tougher way to develop chemistry from the get-go. So it was it was a, a real challenge for Brett, but he, you know, he's such a pro as he was when he played. And uh, sometimes he's even a little too tough on himself in, in critiquing himself and breaking himself down. But uh, it, very quickly, he figured it out. And, of course, Jamie already has it figured out. So I think now we've got two seasoned, experienced analysts. And uh, once we get into the rhythm of uh, switching on and off, and and our first telecast won't be opening night. That'll be an NBCSN game with the national crew. But our first telecast will be in Los Angeles, uh, game two, the first road game. Uh, All three of us will be on that show just to kind of introduce the the new um, situation to the viewers. And and that'll be great. It'll be fun. And after that, we'll uh, do that periodically, but not very often. Most often, you'll have um, either Brett or uh, Jamie with me. But I don't think it's going to uh, be a problem at all. And, you know, the, the reality is there's people out there who love hearing me and Jamie, and there's other people who prefer hearing me and Brett. And now everybody's happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. And, and, and the chemistry that all the broadcasters have you, uh, Brett, Jamie, Dan, even Bro- with Brody. I think it, it's just such a cohesiveness that's going on there. That's such a great presentation to uh, Sharks fans. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, of course, last year we heard a lot of Dave Maley on radio. And Dave has moved on and moved back to Minnesota. And now on on uh, the occasions when both Jamie and Brett are with me, we'll have Devin Setaguchi working with Dan Rusinowski on radio. So that even brings another more interesting element, uh, a very popular member of the Sharks alumni who's made his home here in the Bay Area, and uh, Seto's excited to be involved. So uh, you, you may also see him on the pre and post on uh, television with Brody and Curtis Brown. So, you know, the, the, uh, the group is growing uh, in a good direction, and uh, I think fans are, are getting a uh, high-quality product from our analysts uh they bring so much experience whether it comes from stanley cup champion experience from a brett hedekin or historical perspective of jamie baker from those great teams in the 90s uh which he of course was such a big part of and then you have a more contemporary point of view uh from a more recent part of the sharks era from setaguchi so you're you're getting it from all corners and all sides and i think uh, fans are going to be really happy with the type of uh, analysis they hear from our color commentators this year yeah, it's going to be a great, great addition. I like Setaguchi coming in. He did great with Ruzi uh, the other night. So during the, the off season, uh, SAP Center added new LED lighting over the ice. It's going to bring a great element on camera to the broadcast on NBC Sports California. Uh, I would assume it also helps uh, you and your analysts call the game a little bit better as well. Absolutely. Uh, before the change... The, the type of lighting we had, the type of bulbs, uh, did not instantly come on. So really, uh, since the inception of San Jose Arena at the time, now SAP Center, we have 
cataloged, of course, all the video from all the games over the years and, and any highlights of significance that we've saved over the years of things that occurred in the first five or six minutes of periods have kind of a green or yellow tinge to them. Right. Because it, it took that long for those bulbs to come up to full candle power. And that affects the video quality. And I think even viewers at home would notice that there was sometimes a yellow, almost green t tint to the look on TV early in periods until it got bright enough. And uh, it's these new LED bulbs, in addition to the additional candle power they, they produce, they're instant on, instant off. And I know there were some people who uh, had some concerns in the first home game with those lights that it was too bright. And I think they were right. And they've since adjusted that. They were different last night. They, they toned them down just a little bit. And there's also a, a tremendous number of things they can do as far as visual effects with those lights. And, of course, we all are familiar with the uh, LED wristbands that the Sharks have used during the, the playoffs to create just a, an amazing uh, look in the building and do special effects with that. And with this new lighting system, uh, they're capable of doing that with the lights. So you're going to see on opening night a lot of fun stuff that they're able to do with it. But more to your point, it's a, it's a much better, cleaner, brighter look on television. And it certainly does make for a, a better call for us. It's just easier to see. Things are more defined. And unfortunately, as broadcasters and our arena is included, they stick us pretty high up in the rafters and pretty far away from that little puck. And uh, as some of us announcers age, of course, that not me. I <laughs> not don't you, of age. Course, no. But ever, all the other ones around the league who are getting older every year, um, every little bit of light helps those older guys. Yeah, and I think it looks really dynamite on on in person, and I can't wait to see it on ice when you guys are calling games. And speaking of calling games, do you look forward to calling games when both Melker and Eric Carlson are on the ice? Yeah, I haven't quite sorted that out, but I I just think for purposes of newness. Uh, it'll probably be the full Eric Carlson whenever he has the puck, and it'll just be Carlson or the Milkman when <laughs> 68 has the puck. So uh, I, I was thinking maybe I go Carlson with Eric Carlson, and then I go EK68 with Melker, but that was shot down. No, 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 no. I remember when you guys, uh, when we had, what, Suter, Sutter, Coach Sutter, Stern. Shooter, Sutter, Sutton, Sturm, and Stern. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the real challenge is going to be when we play Vegas because they have Wild Bill Carlson. And then when we play Washington, which only happens twice, with John Carlson, then there'll be three on the ice. And oh, then goodness. Oh, goodness. Speaking of names, what name has given you the most trouble over the years? Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, you, you eventually get used to all of them. When when Nikolai Habibulin first came in, there was a lot of different pronunciations of his name. Um, I remember Pat Foley, the Chicago Blackhawks announcer, the first time he ever did a Winnipeg Blackhawks game, he refused to call him by his name because he couldn't pronounce it, so he just called him the 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 Jets netminder. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's there's tricky, challenging ones. Uh, there's a Coca Niemi in Montreal this year. That uh, and I don't think I pronounced that right, so that'll probably be the the first big challenge this year. But again, we only play them twice, so we'll figure it nice, out. Nice, nice. <laughs> and, and his backup goaltender is Auntie Niemi, so right, like, just throws just to make right it a in. More fun, exactly. So, like many of us here at Teal Town USA, we've been around the organization since the beginning, and this is the 25th anniversary of SAP Center. What is your favorite moment or, for that matter, your favorite call inside the Shark Tank? And I'm, I'm guessing it's probably not that earthquake during the uh, Colorado series. No, um, probably favorite call now that I look back on it. Sometimes I'm a little embarrassed about it because it's a call from a game in October. But Marco Sturm scored a huge goal in a hellacious come-from-behind victory, I believe, over Boston. Yep. at SAP Center, and I had a call that was, this is unbelievable. I, I was able to stretch the word <laughs> unbelievable into eight syllables. So uh, that's sort of uh, one of the signature calls from in our building that I remember. And as far as moments, I've got to say my probably my favorite moment ever, well, probably two. Uh, number one was 
for a long time. The Sharks return from the road when they knocked out Detroit in the first round on the Jamie oh, yeah. Baker goal and then went to Toronto and got a split in the first two games. And the Shark Tank faithful hadn't seen the team since game five because in those days it was a 2-3-2 format. Right. So they hadn't seen the team since game five of the Detroit series. And then they ended up winning that series. And then they got the split in Toronto and came home one one in that series and the electricity in the arena when the players came through the shark head and everybody was already on their feet all with towels all in white i think back then yep. and the place was like i could never have imagined it to be that early in the in the history of the franchise so that that spine tingling moment number one and then spine tingling moment number one a or i could put this one in front of that would be game six against St. Louis when the handshake was on the ice. And I think most of us in the arena or at home watching had tears in our eyes mm -hmm. because the Sharks were going to the Stanley Cup. Uh, yeah, that was both of those, Randy, are just bring back so good memories, you know, that just uh, breathtaking. And I remember that game against Boston. That was a crazy game. That was for sure. <laughs> um, so as we wrap this up here, in being with the Sharks since day one, would you say this team going into the regular season on paper is the best Sharks squad ever? You could make that argument um, because you have two Norris Trophy winners. You have certainly two future Hall of Famers, Joe Thornton guaranteed and Eric Carlson pretty much guaranteed. I, I don't think there's any two-time Norris Trophy winner who isn't in the Hall of Fame. And I don't think they'll make an exception for him. I mean, since he's come into the NHL, he's the leading scorer among defensemen. So uh, while he wasn't hasn't won a championship yet, um, I, he's going to go to the Hall of Fame. And then you you, you look at our depth. Uh, it might not appear to be as solid at center ice because of what we've talked about with, with two guys projected to start at center on the third and fourth lines who've never played an NHL game. But the other depth that we have um, on the wings – um, and our our second line center, or you could argue first line center, depending on what you think the Sharks' first line is. Uh, Logan Couture has developed into, I think it's fair to say, the Sharks' top offensive player. So uh, you've got tremendous amount of depth uh, at the forward position. Arguably the best defense in the NHL. Nashville might argue with you, and they have a really good one. You might have the best defensive pair in the league in Vlasic and Eric Carlson. And you've got a goaltender who's really good, who has a chance to become great. And this will be a fun year to see what Martin Jones brings, because I think he really has that opportunity with this team in front of him to go from being considered one of the really good goalies in the NHL to that, that upper tier. And, and this is a, a, a tremendous opportunity for him and everybody on the team. I haven't been this excited going into a season that I can remember. Um, so to answer your question, I'll, I would say this is on paper, the best lineup that a Sharks coach has ever been able to put on the ice. This is a dream for Pete DeBoer. It won't go without its, its bumps along the way. And, and, you know, forks in the road and you have to have injury luck and things have to fall your way. But this could be a really special, special year. And when you have that, you know, expectation, it makes for an exciting start to the season. Uh, this, the likes of which we probably never have had before. I can't agree with you more. I, I, I hope you're able to say this year is unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> yes. So Randy, as always, thank you so much. Uh, people can find you on the Twitter machine and on Instagram at shark voice. Randy Hahn, as always a pleasure to speak with you as a, this season. Great to be on with you, Eric. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to another cast from Teal town USA. Remember to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Teal town USA Subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on the web at tealtownusa.com.